Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Adam Golov, Marketing Communications Manager at Data Conversion Laboratory, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know we will allow time at the end of the webinar for questions and answers. So please write your questions in the chat area as they come to mind. If we don't have time to answer them all, we'll make them available on our website. Next slide, please. For those of you who are not familiar with DCL, we convert and organize content to create electronic documents, populate databases, publish on the web, and basically get it ready for tomorrow's technology. Next slide, please. DCL services help you refine your document conversion strategy, identify document redundancy, extract metadata, and transform legacy and future documents for real needs today and in the future. We serve a very broad client base spanning all industries. Today we are thrilled to introduce Nave Greenberg, Director of U.S. Defense Development at DCL. Nave is a PMI certified project management professional with expertise in large-scale complex conversions utilizing numerous DT DTD standards. He specializes in conversions for DCL's defense and tech doc business units and has been instrumental in developing DCL's DITA 2361-451 S1000D and 38784 conversion software suites, as well as working with clients to develop detailed project business rules. Nave is a member of the US S1000D Management and Implementation Group, Land Working Group, and participates in other discussion subgroups. He has been with DCL for over 10 years and holds a BE in Mechanical Engineering from Stony Brook University. Without further ado, welcome Nave. Thank you, Adam. Hi, everyone. Hope everybody is doing well. Uh, today we will discuss uh, digitizing uh, legacy data. And when you think about the process of uh, dig digitization, you probably imagine scanning a large amount of paper, uh, running it through an OCR tool, uh, maybe do some proofreading and save to PDF. Uh, some may do indexing and metadata, and some will even take it further, a uh, step further, and go to HTML, XML, uh, and other tag data. So it, it, it's pretty well defined, but it's not such a trivial uh, uh, process. So the agenda for the next 25, 35 minutes uh, will cover a discussion on planning the process. Uh, we will follow up with the process itself, and the process uh, may cover uh, inventory and assessment, uh, zoning, OCR, proofreading, metadata and indexing, and we will finish with discussing what will you do past the point of OCR. So you're taking it to FrameMaker, or HTML, XML, or just leave it as a PDF. And if you still have questions, uh, at the end, we'll try to have a question and answer uh, session. So every presentation I have that has anything to do with digitizing, conversion, migration, basically anything that has to do with building a process, I always recycle this slide. And there's two main reasons uh, for it. Number one, it's a good example of our project methodology and how to build a process. And also because of the quote, from President Lincoln that said, if I had eight hours to chop down a tree, I'll spend six sharpening my axe, which should be your, your, your thinking every time you have to build a process. The more you plan up front, the less problems you have uh, further down the line. So this is a typical conversion process, and obviously it's not all set in stone, but it's a great model to follow. And there are five basic uh, phases, and if we go, quickly go through each one of them, in phase one, you, you should really analyze the client requirements. It's maybe where you assign the project manager and, and, and maybe the project manager, manager is responsible for assembling the team uh, for the project. And during this phase, you, you need to perform a detailed analysis of the data and review the project requirement. And the goal is to identify upfront the major issues. In step two, you should create project specification and possibly create a sample. And the main purpose of the sample is to make sure that all the rules were implemented correctly and for the client and really all the stakeholders to be on the same, uh, on the same page. In phase three is where any kind of software you have 
or process that you developed in the past is really tweaked or customized per project because not always every project is exactly the same. So this is the phase where you kind of tweak it, tweak it or deal with new issues or, or deal with items that were not dealt before or are new to your uh, process. Uh, phase four is where you do a proof of production and this is where basically you take a, a large sample through the process, through the pr process that you develop, and the sample has to be large enough to be representative of your entire data set. And when everybody is uh, happy with the result, you can sign off and move toward phase five, which is basically the production phase, and where deliveries are made uh, on a grid upon a schedule. And one important item to add is that throughout the process, you should always request ongoing feedback from the client uh, or for the final user. And, and the reason why it's so important to have that, and again, I'm going to call it a client, but uh, that final user involved throughout the process is that it increases the chance of having a very successful project. And even though some clients are not happily involved in the process and they're really, you know, just show me the product in the end of the, uh, when everything is done, you should encourage them at least to at least to review some of the data and, and be involved and, and, and that will mitigate a lot of uh, issues uh, when you move forward. So basically all the stakeholders have to be involved in that uh, creation of the process and throughout the steps of the projects. So this is a typical production process and obviously every project is different and, and but but it gives you the idea that when you build a process uh, it has to be split up to steps, and uh, th there's really ma the main purpose of, of, of separating into a defined step is that it's easier to track and easier to QA. So you have QA spot on every step. You number one, you find issues up front, and your product at the end is a lot more consistent and with less issues. And always resolving the issues up front is a lot easier than uh, finding them later down the line. So it does improve the QA process a lot, something as simple as that. But if we quickly go through uh, a typical uh, process, you know, in step one is when you, know, you may pick, need to pick up the documents. Uh, and it's possible that the documents are already scanned. So uh, delivery can be made either by uploading to an FTP or receiving the data. Uh, using DVDs or other storage means. Uh, and step two is when you create an inventory list. And develop really means to track the data throughout the production process. And it's also when you prepare the data for scanning. Uh, after creating a high quality images, uh, you need to have uh, some image quality and, and also deal with uh, file naming. Uh, in step five, you deal with uh, uh, zoning in this specific one, and I'll discuss, discuss that in detail later. And in, steps, in step six, you have uh, OCR. Uh, step, next step is proofreading, uh, PDF creation, and maybe dealing with uh, 508 compliance. And I'm not going to get uh, too deep into uh, section 508, but it's basically allowing people who are blind to better access the data. and then. And understand the data. So, so you need to focus a lot on formatting and text flow and other items that otherwise maybe, you know, it's not as crucial as uh, as if you don't need to be compliant. Uh, and step eight is when you deal with metadata preparation. Uh, in step nine, you may, con and again, if you continue the process past XML, that's when you. Uh, uh, deal with uh, going to a little bit more sophisticated uh, data, tag data, and we had a lot of webinars discussing that uh, uh, process, and actually next month there's another one that described that process. So I'm not uh, going to focus too much into it. But if you don't go past PDF, this is where you do your final QA. Uh, you may have a possible rework and uh, continuous improvement of the process. Then you get to step 11, in this case, with approval, and then you may need, depending on the project, deal with the uh, uh, destruction of the data and or uh, removal of the data from your uh, facilities. So in a typical project, uh, as we discussed, so, uh, source data is usually submitted in batches. And even if it's not and you get the whole uh, data up front, 
there's still a need to, to lock the data into some sort of a, a, a production control system. And, and, and that system should track each unit. And the unit can be a manual, uh, a set of manual, uh, batches, or, or anything, anything that can, can make tracking the data possible. And you, you can record some metadata about each unit that can help you create useful uh, reports. And metadata, metadata can be batch number, uh, number of pages, date the unit received. And as you convert the units, you can track other metadata, such as the dates that each step uh, uh, of the production process occurred, or duration of each step, and you can have matrix uh, as to how long every step uh, occurred. And this information is also very, very useful to project the, the delivery schedule, uh, confirm that the processes are working uh, properly, and uh, track each unit and see in what step of the production process that unit is in. So any given time, you know where that specific unit is in, in the process. Okay. So next you need to decide what data should be converted and really in what order. So one thing you should do is categorize your data. And some categories that uh, can be used are active documents that are in good shape. Uh, active documents that need a lot of uh, preparation work, some inactive documents that might be retired, and any kind of archival material which maybe you know will never used. And then by doing so, it's a lot easier to prioritize your data. So documents that are mostly used and documents that are uh, up for sustainment should be higher on your list, and some uh, some documents maybe with longer product life or, or, or that, that will be maintained would also be on, on, your, on your list. And once you create the priority list, you start with the most recent and higher priority ones and go back as much as you can, as much as the allows you and the schedule uh, allows you. And at this point, you also need to determine the conversion process. So see if there are any documents that can be digitized as is. And it could be documents that are uh, uh, maybe with high quality images, clean, no uh, 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 undefined text, which we're going to cover uh, later on. And you also need to, to, to maybe uh, deal with some documents that will require some preliminary works. Maybe some cleanup, uh, maybe you know, the whole disk and the speckle, and we're going to discuss that. Uh, you may also determine that some data is not worth converting, and the one that you archive. And uh, if you don't go past PDF, you might as well just uh, maybe OC, uh, scan it in OCR because that process is fairly simple. The, the process of going past that may be a little bit more costly. So here's an example of data that might end up on your low priority list of the conversion, or, or maybe not at the lowest end, but they may require you to, to do some cleanup or, or decision as to how the process is going to be handled with these documents. So just as an example, you know, a lot of old data, it's very difficult to find what's bold, what's not bold, and when it's bold and tied to each other, it's very difficult for the OCR tool to, to recognize the characters. Uh, the second example is just poor quality of the image. Some documents are just in such poor shape that you might as, the, as well just hand, you know, the, and have some people just type it in and, and, and save the time of OCR and clean up. And a lot of documents may have uh, all kind of uh, handwritten uh, uh, data or stamps that were done years ago. And, uh, and there are ways to deal with these pages, but, but it's, it's always a good practice to have an analysis phase when you flag these pages and try to develop a process to handle these pages so they don't hit you down the line and you find it ahead of time and come up with a plan before you get into production. Uh, because if you find it later, it will slow down the production by a lot. And there are ways to, to, again, as we said, to, to improve the quality of the in images, and it's not always guaranteed to work, but you can attempt them before you decide to, to kind of uh, either put them down your priority list or deal with uh, entering data manually. And some of the some of the items is the skew when you when you basically the document is not aligned when it's scanned, and all that is needed is just to tilt it a few degrees, you know, clockwise or counterclockwise, 
in order to align it uh, properly. Uh, the speckle is when you remove the, all the dots, the positive and negative spots that you see on documents, uh, and you smooth edges and you clean it up, but leave the complex items like an image or, or, or a table untouched. Uh, you can convert the images from color or grayscale to black and white, and that could be improved uh, the text part of the OCR uh, uh, tool, and or do line removal, which cleans items like uh, you know the box around warning or, or any kind of thick line. Uh, if the font size is extremely small, you, you can scan the image at a higher resolution, uh, or maybe even try uh, here specifically use grayscale. Uh, but it does slow the OCR uh, process. So really the result of scanning uh, documents is, is, is an image, a set of images. And the OCR software converts the images into words by extracting the data and trying to read the data. But the software now always recognizes the data by its own. Uh, and, and Or maybe the type of uh, data that it's extracting, like tables or figure and so on. Uh, so to indicate to the software what to read, you draw uh, frames around each table, image, or body of text that the software must read. So zoning is required and very important to control the flow of the OCR software by indicating the, the parts of the page that the OCR tool will read and the sequence that the OCR will read by because it is very crucial and sometimes it's very difficult for an OCR engine to figure out the correct flow of the text. So by doing so, yes, you draw the boxes manually, but you guarantee that the text flow is uh, uh, proper. And zoning also requires you to identify the image. So you can properly uh, box an image and, and eliminate white space and do the correct dimension and include the right data. And proper zoning also allows you to avoid all the extraneous uh, text that may not be needed, and we'll cover that. And if you do not zone the document, the software just attempts to read boxes around Word and other kind of marking inside images. Uh, so zoning is, is a very important step. So here's an example when zoning is, is used and, and important for text flow and text recognition. You can see the number the number of boxes that allows the OCR tool uh, to know in what order to zone the page. And when it comes to figure or some, especially when it comes to figure, uh, the OCR tool will kind of zone and, and select some of the text uh, of the image and, and attempt to convert it to text. So you can see over here the boxes, it's a two column table, but in some cases it's uh, span over the page and, and it's a bit difficult for an OCR tool to detect the, te the text flow properly and even to detect sometimes tables. So uh, if you just go to PDF, it might not be uh, critical, but uh, uh, most of the time you go past PDF and the text flow needs to be corrected and the table needs to be a table and, and uh, a figure needs to be just a raster image. And if you don't make it a raster image, it's just a lot of mo more data that you, you will have to proofread. So for one, uh, like in some cases, and again, we were discussing the OCR, this is an example where an OCR tools uh, try to, to read items like uh, an image, maybe math equation, uh, chemical formulas, or all kind of charts, and, and, and again, if you have limited time and a lot of data to deal with, you will need to rely on automation, and you won't be able to fix uh, everything uh, manually, but this is just an example of how the OCR tools kind of mistaken the, in the first example, the chemical uh, formulas to text and really produces, uh, uh, in many cases, garbage. So in one of our automated conversion tasks, a solution was to use a, a, like really a specially developed image software uh, to, identify, to identify all the non-text uh, uh, section, and that included real images or images that were just or text, part of text that was just too difficult and too blurry for an OCR tool to deal with. Uh, so these items were black off and identified as to the type and, and lo size, location, and basically removed from the page image. And if you can see the result is a page image with clear text and white space along with separate images 
uh, for each of the items that was uh, uh, extracted. And because we capture metadata, like the location of the item on the page and the size of the image, uh, it's easier for us to later on uh, link from the text that was extracted and place the images in the correct uh, uh, location. And you can see over here, it's kind of hard to see, but the, uh, the item over here, one, is the image that was extracted from here. And then later on, because we keep all the metadata, we can link it back. And then you, an image is a real image, and text is real text. And then the OCR is a lot more accurate, and it's any OCR tool, uh, will be more accurate extracting just the text that it's supposed to and not touch the images. So tables are, are usually problematic if, if you are not if they're not detected as table by the OCR tool. And if you only care about text and, and your plan is to go just to PDF or maybe text behind and unstructured text, uh, it's not as critical, uh, but it's always better to have uh, structured text even if you go to PDF. So determine it to detect it as a table and not just as a text behind. But if you are going past PDF, uh, even if you go just to Microsoft Word or to Framework or anything, uh, not necessarily XML, a table needs to be done as a table. And if you can see over here, you can do the cleanup in the OCR tool and, and, and merge cells or leave it later on for, for a cleanup. Uh, it, it's, it's zoned properly and then it's a lot easier to handle. So to save some time, there's really no need to zone the table header and, and title past the first page if it's a continuous table. And if you plan to go to XML, you definitely don't need all the repetitive uh, table uh, headers and, and, and table titles because it's auto-generated when you convert it to, let's say, XML. Or even in more, when you start something as, a, let's say, a table header, you can automatically generate it uh, in your uh, output file. And, you know, Take it even a step further, when you go to XML and there are standards like uh, S1000D or 40051, some tables are actually content tables. So they're not tagged as a table, but they're really a set of special elements that later on the style sheet displays them as a table even though they were not tagged as a table. And in this specific, ratio, uh, in this specific cases, uh, it's crucial to zone the table properly. And if it's structured properly, the mapping from XML to the element is a lot easier. And something simple as even merging a cell or including the right uh, 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 entry in the right location will save you a lot of time when you do mapping of the data to uh, XML. So OCR tools have some built-in uh, tools that make proofing, proofing a bit easier. Uh, so if you, you, you know, you can highlight a character before your OCR. Uh, if the OCR is not certain about it, you will highlight or set uh, a dictionary that you can select or even build for yourself. Um, and, uh, but, and again, but it's limited. The problem with the OCR is that there's uh, uh, cases that it's not always going to recognize properly. Uh, so for example, if you have A11, it may translate it to ALL and not even pick it up as an error. And you have to be very um, alert as to every character and check character by ca character with an OCR tool to make sure that everything was done properly. You know, and you have the usual OCR issues with zero and O's, B and eight, uh, capital I and lowercase L, which are mistakenly uh, used. So you need to find really a more efficient way to review the data after you OCR it. And Simply by changing the fonts of, uh, and, and, and the process, you can increase accuracy, accurate accuracy uh, and mitigate incorrect uh, results. So if you go starting from the, the right, really over here, and going uh, counterclockwise, uh, simply by importing new fonts that enhance the, the known problematic issue of OCR, uh, you can uh, increase uh, uh, the accuracy. So you have uh, one with a small strike through, which will allow you to kind of uh, tell you this is one and not uh, L or I, and, and, or zero with a line, which will distinguish it from an O, 
uh, spaces, something as simple as spaces uh, is uh, uh, critical if you go to uh, uh, past PDF, if you go to XML, it also will affect uh, search uh, capabilities. If words are combined, they're not uh, truly uh, a, correct, a correct word, and sometimes it's very difficult to see a space. So simply by changing a symbol and changing a font, it helps a lot uh, uh, in detecting those errors. And another very simple uh, process that we're doing, which increases uh, accuracy a lot and actually speeds up the process uh, by more than 50%, simply by decreasing the real estate of the windows that you're dealing with when you're doing the proofreading in the OCR tool and aligning the TIFF image with the extracted uh, text and just giving enough real estate uh, to deal with that character level and by moving the cursor with the arrow cursor left and right, it tracks it also in the image one. It, when, when somebody looks at it, it there's less uh, distraction for the person to look at it and, and uh, detect errors. And it's a very, very small uh, uh, change, but it, it does increase accuracy a lot. And we, and we found that uh, uh, by you know, by simply doing that and, and, and increasing the real estate, uh, it the process w was increased by at least half, and the accuracy rate went very, very uh, a lot, increased by a lot. And again, once you extract the data, and the data is in ASCII format, it's a lot easier to develop all kind of scripts, and, and you don't have to be a, 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 a Social programmer or developer to to develop the sophisticated script, you can you know run a a, a simple software that checks for spaces before dashes, uh, uh, commas that appear in a new line, uh, uh, a sentence that suddenly drops and then you have a lowercase uh, text, uh, a paragraph starting with lowercase. There may be a, a, a hard written that is not needed, uh, an add. Uh, um, string of characters, let's say you have characters, then suddenly a, a number in between could be a suspicious character. By doing it by software, you can detect a lot of uh, false detection, but it's a lot easier to pick up stuff that otherwise, by doing it manually, it will be impossible to pick if you're dealing with a lot of data. And you can tweak those rules and come out with uh, a more defined matrix as to what your errors are. And, and, and again, that's a kind of a trial and error when you get uh, that exact middle point between uh, automation and manual work, but you have to rely on some automation, because otherwise going character by characters manually will take a very, very long time. Uh, and again, once once you take out the data and, you, and you're done with your uh, um, OCR, and let's say your data can go to Microsoft Word or any kind of word processing, you have more tools to, to actually look at the, at the structure of the data and look that, let's say, steps were not combined, tables were continued, uh, typos were not there, uh, uh, numbering of paragraphs are consistent, and you have a, lot, a broader range of, of checks that you can do on your documents. So once you OCR and proof it uh, the data, what do you do with the data? And you know you, you could deal with metadata, which is really searchable information about the content, and, and metadata can be used for, for making content more findable. An example of metadata can be abstract description, keywords, uh, author, date, caption, any kind of information that can either be extracted from the page uh, or, or from a catalog. So it's not necessarily, you know, you can combine a, a, a way to look at a separate database that is sitting somewhere else and say, okay, I'm in this data and I detected that this has to deal with a specific subject. You can write software that goes to that database and pick up all kind of uh, metadata that is required for that uh, uh, specific section. But in order to get to that point, you need to set up your process. So there is, there, is, there is the need for analysis and uh, uh, set up in the front. And obviously PDF text behind is widely used and, and 
here you really replicate the look of a, of a printed page and you have full text uh, search, searchability, uh, but it's not easily reflowable, uh, which really you, you retain the original format, when this, but when, especially when you take it to ebook and smartphone or any kind of devices that is being used now, and it makes it more difficult to use. And, and, and it's also not easily taken apart. And that leads to, to, to outputs such as XML and HTML and EPUB when it's ref, when another really refor, reflowable uh, pro, uh, format that gives you maximum, uh, maximum flexibility. And there are a number of choices. I mean, XML allows you to incorporate text, images, videos, all kind of other data. And it also allows you to add structure and, and non-content information uh, that might be needed to reformat uh, content in ebooks or the web and then and all kind of uh, other devices that are being used today. And it also allows you to modulize your content so that it can be assembled in different components and uh, uh, and produced in different kind of publication. And standard like DITA and uh, 40,051 and S1000D are just a few examples. And th there are really many variation uh, that really have been de developed for specific uh, industries and niches. I mean, besides s 1000 d you can have NLM, that is for journal publishing format, that is used for medical and other scientific researchers. And again, and, and you keep hearing about s 1000 d in data that, again, allows you to, to modulize your data and increase the reuse that otherwise you wouldn't be able to do. And Again, and obviously HTML for displaying on the web and EPUB for uh, 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 for for ebooks. So that was a quick overview, and uh, if anybody has questions, I will try to answer them. Thank you, Nave. Very informative webinar indeed. <clears throat> we have several questions that have been submitted. <clears throat> the first being. Is the QC software something you developed or a commercial off-the-shelf software? Uh, the QC software, well, the, there's, uh, I mean, the few QC software, we did develop uh, the QC software, but it's, it's project specific. So if you're talking about, specifically about proofreading, uh, with, uh, Proofreading, you you know specifically here. Sorry. Specifically here, uh, again, it's not a sophisticated software. As long as you know the data and you know what to look for, you develop a set of rules. Whether even if it's an XML, you six schematron. If it's in just pure ASCII format, any kind of uh, programming software can be used to uh, look for specific rules and basic rules that are known. You know, CR for the hard returns. You know, you, you know, if you start a paragraph with a lowercase letters, you know, something might be wrong. If you have a, a number, a digit, and then a dash, and then space, and another one, another string of characters, that could be also be suspicious. If you have a, a, a space before a, a, a period, that's already something suspicious. No space after a comma. All of all, all of this kind of uh, uh, checks are uh, customized per project and something that we develop. But, but the reason, and again, the reason why we had to develop it is because when you deal with legacy data, it's different. Uh, you know, even between your, your entire data set, uh, things are different. And, and usually, most of the time, we go past PDF and we go to HTML or XML, uh, where uh, structure is important. And you know, one solution doesn't fit all. So if you can tweak the tool that you got, fine. But we find it easy that it's just uh, easily to determine like a project-specific rules. It's very easy to implement by software, and we do it uh, uh, case by case. Like this example, for example, the QC software over here was done on Microsoft Word using Visual Basic. But it can be anything. Like for example, if you know that this is a set of steps, usually if you go one, two, and then jump to four. There's an issue, and the step was done uh, as uh, you know there was no hard return before the three. So it's not super critical when you just deal with PDF, 
but it's extremely critical when you have to tag them as steps when you go far, uh, you know, past uh, uh, PDF. And even if you go to word processing, the reason why it's so critical is that if this is defined as a step and you sustain the data and you start adding a step down the line, now suddenly that step is not three unless you go back and renumber everything. The steps can be auto numbered, and then if it's done properly, any kind of sustainment in the future will be automatically uh, 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 kind of updated when you add a step. So really, the answer is uh, it's something that we customize simply because you know when you come to that, uh, legacy data is very different from case to case. Thank you, Nava. The next question that has come in is, um, earlier you were discussing proofreading. If you have a very large project, are you planning to proofread every page? Um, well, again, I, I mean, obviously it depends what the contract uh, requires you. If, if it, I mean, it, it's a yes or no answer, but uh, if, if, the, if the contract doesn't require you, then and you have, let's say, a million pages going character by character is, is, is an enormous task that uh, takes a lot of time. If you have uh, just simple math, if you have uh, an average page of 3,000 characters and going and doing it the right way, and I actually, if you go and do character by character, it can take, and you're dealing with four minutes a page, that's a lot of hours that uh, you're dealing with just to do the proofreading. And what we found was that, and again, this is actually why we developed this process, because in some cases, and again, it wasn't a million pages, but when we had a big project that did require character by character uh, proofreading, we found it almost impossible for somebody, and it doesn't make a difference how uh, focused you are and how uh, uh, detailed oriented you are, a human cannot look at a full page and, and, and focus on that character. And there's so many distractions around that that you don't do your job properly. And by minimizing the real estate, we cut down, and I think it was initially four minutes a page and went down to almost two minutes a page. So the cut was more than 50% when we just simply replaced, I mean, kind of lowered the real estate and replaced the funds. But even if you're dealing with two uh, minutes a page, that's a lot when you're dealing with... Uh, million pages. So, I mean, I would say, you know, if it's not needed, you can combine manual proofreading with automation, and that could save a lot of time. Obviously, if the contract is, is required you to go character by character, then obviously the answer is that you have to, but uh, I don't, you know, you look at the added value and you see how many errors you find, I don't believe you have to go uh, character by character. Great. Thank you, Nave. Um, and that is all the questions we have received today. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending. This will conclude today's broadcast. You'll be able to access the recorded version in the webinar archive section on our website located at www.dclab.com. Our next webinar will be tomorrow, Wednesday, February 23rd, and 24th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time titled, What are the Strengths and Weaknesses of Data Adoption? Being presented by Dr. Joanne Hackles. Director of CIDM and Stan Doherty, Technical Publications Manager of SimpliVidi Corporation and an active member of the OASIS Data Technical Committee and Data Adoption Committee. Thank you everyone for attending. Great day.